Hi, my name is Beth and I am a programming assistant for the St. John's County Public Library and I am here today to present a St. John's Reads program, a tour of the Timaquan Ecological and Historic Preserve Museum facility. So we're here today for St. John's Reads. St. John's Reads is our one book, one community program. We are featuring the library book and um, t we're trying to see what different libraries are like, so different collections, how they're different from the public library. So let's go ahead and meet Anne Llewellyn, the curator of Timaquan Preserve. Hi, Anne. Thanks for joining me here today. Hi, Beth. Thanks for having <laughs> me. Can you tell me, actually, where are we? Yes, we're in the museum storage building at the Timaquan Ecological and Historic Preserve in Jacksonville, Florida. We house the collections, museum collections for four small parks in Northeast Florida, the Timiquan Preserve, Fort Caroline National Memorial, the Castillo de San Marcos, and Fort Matanzas in St. Augustine. So this is all part of the National Park Service? Yes. Oh, okay, great. And um, can you tell me a little bit about your background, how long you've worked for the National Park Service? Yes, I worked for the National Park Service for about 23 years. I've been here at Timiquan for 19 years. Um, I got a college degree from a small liberal arts college in Ohio, and a couple of years after that, I got a volunteer position with the Student Conservation Association out at Glacier National Park in Montana, and that opened my eyes to all the opportunities there are in national parks across the country. Um, I worked for Yellowstone National Park, Cuyahoga Valley National Park in Ohio, and then the Southeast Archaeological Center in Tallahassee, and all those places I was a museum technician cataloging, accessioning, um, doing research requests for museum materials, which we'll talk about more later today. And now I've been at Timiquan Preserve for about 19 years doing the same thing here. Great. But you're actually, your job title is curator, correct? Yes, museum curator. Awesome. And what kind of educational background would someone need for a job like that? Generally, you need a four-year degree. Um, you can major in anything, history, archaeology, anthropology, biology, any of those um, subjects is a good, good uh, major to have. And then I also have a master's degree in Museum of Studies, but that's not required to, uh, to get a job at the Park Service in this field. So Anne, what kind of collections are stored here? Well, we have the museum collections for the four parks in, Flor in Northeast Florida, and that is anything to do that's either generated on the, in the park or donated to the park or created for the park. So we have things like all the archives for the park, so anything to do with research, um, construction projects, engineering projects, utility projects that were done over the past you know, 80 years till the creation of the park are stored here. We have um, records on the, some of the buildings that were done, like the, the headquarters building at the Castillo, um, drawbridges at the Castillo that were rebuilt in the 90 or the, in the 1900s. We also have archaeological collections, so any um, archaeological work that's done at the parks, either by a university field school or by um, required, um, required what we call compliance archaeology, all those materials are stored here. We have a lot of historic objects that people have donated over the years to the parks to help fill some theme related to the park. So um, each park has their own enabling legislation that tells kind of why the park is established. So we have things related to that legislation and the theme of the park. Um, right now, we don't really, we don't get as many donations of historic objects because the Park Service philosophy right now is that we only collect items that are uh, site specific. So for example, we know various maybe cannons or guns were used at the Castillo de San Marcos. We'll only accept guns that were actually used at the fort that we know of. Uh -huh. And otherwise we just become a repository for old antiques that have nothing really to do with the park itself. Gotcha, that makes sense. Yes, yeah, so we also have photographs um, from all the parks over the year. We have a great photo collection. We have some um, you know, video recordings of things over the years. And um, I think that's about it. What about um, as far as visiting the collection? I, I called and made an appointment with you. Is this something that anybody can just walk in and, and visit or how does this work? Uh, generally we're open to bona fide researchers only, which can be college students working on papers, we have grad students, um, professional um, 
uh, you know, writers, amateur writer, anyone who's researching a topic that relates to the park has, will can contact me and I can help them either by email or in person or over the phone looking up things in the collection. We have finding aids for most of the collections, the archival collections, so I can send a finding aid to someone to see if what they're looking for is in the collection. Uh, the park staff uses the collection a lot. So say our maintenance guys are rebuilding um, a structure um, they, and they need uh, reference, the reference or the original uh, map of, the, of that structure, I can dig that out of the archives and copy it and give it to them. Um, also, if you want to know, say, where the underground utilities are, were placed you know, 50 years ago, hopefully I have the drawings for that so we can look that up. Um, we, are, we, we can uh, do special tours, so if, you, if the public is interested in coming, you can contact me and I can give you a tour, but generally we are closed to the public um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so that is different from the public library. That's part of part of what this tour is about, just to see what differences there are between different kinds of collections. So thanks. Sure. Um, is any of your collection digitized? Yes, we have. Um, I think our entire photo collection is digitized. Unfortunately, it's not online. But if you contact me, I can help you. You know, find what you're looking for. Um, we have some of our. Um, CD and VH, old VHS tapes, if people remember what those oh, are, yeah. those were all digitized. We have those. Um, not many of our um, actual, you know, 8 by 11 documents are, of course, what we call like our correspondence collections, but there are some maps and oversized plans that are digitized, um, and I can get a link to that to Beth to put on the website if they want, of where you can find some old of uh, the Castillo plans that are on the, on the website. That would be amazing. Well, one more question. Can I have a tour? Sure. All right, let's come on, go. Come on back. Okay. Okay, so so this is the curatorial room or what? Yeah, so we have two storage rooms. This is our objects room. This is our three-dimensional objects. Uh, we have various racks and cabinets, and we'll come back and look at a couple of these. All right. This is our what we call architectural storage. So this is any these are um, actually just pieces of buildings in the parks. There's some railings. There are some window, screen windows. There's just parts of, uh, this is a port from a porch. So we save these so we can have pieces of the actual buildings either to show what kind of wood was used, what kind of paint was used, maybe the woodworking style to build the building. And that way in the future, um, future people will know what was um, the exact you know, method of construction was. And it's good to have like the, a paint chip to show what color paint they used to, to paint the buildings. So these are our museum cabinets. These are uh, nice metal, um, pretty sturdy. They're archivally safe. So you might be, hear me say that word. Um, everything we do is archivally safe, uh, which means it won't uh, off gas um, bad chemicals and cause the museum collections to um, either discolor or break down faster than they normally would. So here's a cabinet with some of the Castillo um, bottles. This is the bottle collection. So these were all found either uh, during archaeological uh, projects, either probably in a well or in the courtyard or in the moat of the park. Um, Very neat. Yeah. Look at that. Very cool. And then we also save broken pieces of glass. So these are just the bases of the bottles. You see there's a square bottle here. That's so neat. Look at all the different colors too. Yes. And a lot of these we have, what we, this is what we call cavity packed. So we put them in these little boxes with foam around them. So they don't change, they don't uh, move if the, if the cabinet gets shaken. It keeps, keeps them from touching each other as well. And I see everything has a little number on there. Yes, so everything is cataloged in our National Park Service Museum database. So everything has a catalog number, an individual number and the number gets written on the object and also goes in our computer so we can look up anything in the computer by number to find out where it came from when it was added to the collection um, we might put down the size the color uh, any information we have on it Neat. this is another cabinet it contains some of our ceramic collection or pottery so this is a piece of olive jar Ooh. olive jar was a storage jar the spanish used from the 1600s all the way through about the 1800s and there's a lot of pieces of it found in saint augustine so you can see this is uh, some of the bigger pieces wow they're often glazed with a green glaze neat those are beautiful yeah and some of them have sometimes they have a reddish clay with them too neat I've noticed 
that it's a little bit colder in this, actually not a little bit, it's noticeably <laughs> colder in this room than, than where we originally started out. Is there a reason for that? Yes, we like to keep museum collections at a fairly cool temperature and a fairly low relative humidity. So we try to keep uh, the, the rooms here about 68 degrees and about 50% relative humidity. Now in Florida, you know, it's, it's pretty humid in Florida, so 50% is, is good for around, for in the building if we can keep it. But we recently do that is because mold will grow at about 65% or higher. So you mm. want to keep the, the humidity down to keep mold from growing on objects. And also, variation, big variations or swings in temperature or humidity will call, cause fragile items to break or crack. Oh. So we try to keep everything kind of stable and just real low swings in those in temperature and relative humidity to keep the objects um, from breaking. Because part of our job as museum curators is to preserve all these objects in perpetuity for future generations. So we okay. want to save them. Well, that makes sense. So I guess just wear a sweater when you come. Exactly. <laughs> and also we like to keep light levels low because light can damage materials, especially wood, textiles, or paper. You might notice that the newspaper you get, um, if you have it out at all outside, it will fade really quickly. So if you, if you have high light levels, it can damage um, museum artifacts too, especially like I said, wood, textile, and paper. So we try to keep the lights off if we're not in here. Everything is in a cabinet. Everything is, is, is covered by a muslin drape. That's also to keep dust off them. Um, another thing that we need to do to help the, keep the environment stable is to keep insects and rodents away from the collection. So we try to keep all bugs out that means regular, regular cleaning all the time. Um, you, you need to keep all you know, mice, uh, bats, and those kind of things out of the collection because any insects or rodents will eat, will chew paper, chew cloth, and damage the collections. Absolutely. So here's some cannonballs, which everyone seems to like, and they're super heavy for their, for their size. Oh, wow. That's really cool looking, but I've noticed that you've all of a sudden put on these white cotton gloves. Is there a reason for that? Yes, so the, the current thinking, you might have seen uh, curated wear gloves in the past on, on movies and in, um, in video clips and such. Basically, the current thinking is now to wear gloves when you're touching metal objects and uh, maybe some fragile textiles because oils from your fingers, even if you wash your hands, oils from your fingers can get on the objects and actually you can literally transfer your own fingerprints onto metal uh, like you know, brass or iron objects. So we try to wear gloves for handling objects like that. However, we've kind of decided that we don't need to wear gloves for handling paper because paper is usually so fragile, you can't turn pages very well if you're wearing these kind of gloves. It's true. So basically, as long as your hands are clean, we, we don't wear gloves to handle paper or wood um, or things like that, but for, for metal, we generally do. Okay, well, that's pretty cool. Let me look at this cannonball one more time. One thing to keep in mind in national parks and state parks is not to pick up any cultural resources or objects you find on the ground. So if you find anything, cannonball, a piece of pottery, anything like that, don't pick it up. Just leave it where it is and let a ranger know. Because once you take the object away from where it was, that removes all historic context with it. And it doesn't do um, the archeologists or, or uh, park rangers any good once they don't know where it actually came from. Because context is very important in um, helping decide or helping learn about the history of these objects. So if you find a cannonball, anything, especially at the Castillo or at Fort Matanzas, just leave it alone and tell a ranger where it is. This is another cool object in the collection. It is a sign about the passage of Venus. So this is an astronomical event that happened in 1882. And some of the um, a group, a French contingent came over to watch this um, astronomical event happen of Venus passing in through the sky at a certain time, a certain, um, I, don't, I don't know the whole details of it, but <laughs> apparently they decided it was worth hanging a marble plaque up in the courtyard of the Castillo to talk about it. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty substantial. It is. <laughs> so as well as having cannonballs that look um, to be in good condition, like the ones over here, we also have rusty um, corroded cannonballs. So you can see these four here. So these are pulled out of the ground. This is more what they'll look like when they come out of the ground because there's so much salt air and salty soil over by the ocean that this is how they, this is when the iron um, reacts with the salty sand, this is what happens to them. So when you pull them out, they might just fall apart. So these are ones we need to get conserved. And conservation is a whole process whereby the museum, museum objects get um, 
get treated. We try to do as minimal treatment as possible to get them back to where they are kind of more stable and can be like, possibly exhibited. So we try to do as little, um, we don't try to polish them to make them look all shiny and new, but we want to at least get them stable where they're not going to fall apart. So hopefully at some point we can get some money or find a um, location to get these conserved. So do you, you wouldn't do that yourself. You would send them to a conserve. Correct. Something this big and this substantial in such bad shape, we won't. Occasionally we'll do our own minor conservation. So we can do some small waxing of, of metal objects and, um, yeah, that's about, about all we'll do is, is wax metal. But there's, there are conservators that the Park Service has that will treat paper objects, wood objects, textile objects, metals. So we'll send things up to them and they'll treat them uh, professionally for us because they all have advanced degrees in uh, conservation. So this is a big object that you'll find in the storage room here. This is a door from the Castillo from Casemate 4 which is uh, one, of the, one of the rooms right by the well. Once If you go inside the courtyard and go to the left. Um, this door was taken off in the mid-1990s because it was kind of falling apart. Um, it's made out of wood and metal. It was rusting and falling apart. So they removed it, but they wanted to save it again to, save, to show how things were, bu were, were built. So we had this conserved by a professional conservator. Um, he came down and treated all the iron here. He um, got the rust out of it put some oils in it, put some wax on it and paint, and then the wood we treated um, with wax. So now this is in storage and it can be used by researchers in the future to see what the original door might have looked. This is not the original door from the 1600s, but it's, I think it's, ble I believe it's from the 1800s. So oh, it's okay. still pretty old. It's pretty old. <laughs> yeah. Another thing we have here that you won't find in many of the libraries or um, historical societies is our herbarium collection. So these are pressed plants. So we had a project to um, collect one or two of every plant in the parks, all the different parks in Northeast Florida. So we had hired some professors. They came and they, they collect the plants, they identify them, and then they um, press them and then mount them on this paper. And we save them because that way we can see what kind of plants were here in the year 2005. There might be future scientific methods that we can do on these plants to find out maybe what the air quality was, or soil quality based on the plants. There's, we don't, there's endless possibilities that we just don't know, but maybe in a hundred years, what scientists will be able to do. So we have samples of all the plants, just so we know what was here in 2005 and what the conditions were like. That's neat. So did the parks try to keep um, only native plants in their parks or? Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, we have native plants and then often there's things that are called invasive species. And sometimes the invasive species or plants are brought in from other areas, either other parts of the country or other, or other countries, and they might take over. So things like air potato are a really bad plant right now, Chinese tallow, kudzu up in South Carolina you might have heard of. Um, so anytime the parks have these plants that are kind of taking over the native species, we do try to go in there and remove them either with, by hand pulling or by chemical methods. That's, that's really neat. The, um, besides how beautiful this looks in the just in the case alone, but it has a, it definitely has a scent to it mm -hmm. also. It smells kind of like tea. Yeah, it does. It's, that's pretty neat. I can see a pine cone in there. Yep. So they'll try to save some of the flowers as well as the plant, the, the standard plant, they'll save some of the flowers or pine cones too. So. Very cool. Ooh, what is this? This is our art wall. We're now in the archives room. So this is the room that has all the paper, photographs, um, oversized plans, things like that. But this is our art wall that we made. We actually made it using some household objects. There's wood and there's a little green um, fencing okay. that we treated with some uh, archival um, kind of finish so the wood won't off gas. So this is where we can hang up our pictures and they're upright, but they're not being uh, handled on day-to-day -day basis. Okay. And some, some of your, um, your fans might recognize this painting here. This is the change of the flags. This is actually on exhibit in one of the Castillo casemates for years. And we also had it on exhibit during the city's 450th anniversary a couple in 2016. We had this on exhibit at the um, City Visitor Center. These are our oversized or flat file collection. Um, so you can see there's a, there's a, we have six cabinets of sets of three each. And this is all oversized plans, mostly for the Castillo. So this is where we save things like, um, these are plans, have old plans usually from the 40s, 50s, or 60s in the Castillo. Um, anything to do with the layout of the casemates, like a, there's parking lot paving, electrical systems, landscaping, all sorts of plans in here. 
and it's better to keep them flat because that way if you keep them rolled up it's hard to unroll them and see them and it might damage them have being curled all the time so we try to keep them all flat in here and then the folders themselves are probably archival yes yeah, so these are acid tree folders and um and then they're trying to we try to figure exactly and then blueprints off gas differently their blueprints can be kind of nasty if you ever smell the blueprint so these we put in separate folders to try to keep the, the gases from the blueprints to in a separate kind of separate from the paper the, the standard paper <laughs> this is the Castillo de San Marcos photo collection which is pretty cool I think there's probably 12 or 13,000 pictures in this but what the uh, rangers used to do is take pictures and they'd mount them to these cards. So they'd take a picture, they would write what the subject was, the photographer and the date, and then they'd assign it a location based on what the picture was of. So this is a photo that says buildings, details, stairways. So it's a picture of the, of the stair in the courtyard and it's assigned a number. So these are all now in a spreadsheet um, by number so we can look them up kind of by keyword if someone's looking for a picture of the ramp of the stairs in 1958, we can hopefully find this picture for them. <laughs> and this is our uh, main archival manuscript collection for the Castillo. So these are documents that either the historians, uh, the past historians of the park collected, or park staff, um, just kind of generation of, of files um, during the creation of the park, or during the management of the park, people would save documents about everything. So that's what these are. Um, this is more like you might see in a library or historical society, these kind of, and these are all acid-free boxes um, on these shelves. And then we have this, what we call compact shelving. So these shelves save a little space by not having to have an aisle between every one. There's only one aisle that moves depending yeah. which row you're in. So you can come along and um, this is a collection from Timucuan Preserve over the left. And then we have all this empty space on the right so we can have room for future growth. Oh, nice. Because <laughs> history is always happening. It's always happening. This is what's called a data logger. So this records the temperature and relative humidity of the space. So we're in the lab room right now. And once an hour, the little um, sensor on here takes the relative humidity and the temperature. And then every about six or eight weeks, I download it to see what's going on. So this can help if there's a sudden um, spike due to the power being out or something, we can know what happened and maybe explain if something happened or know if we need to go back in and, and um, rectify, you know, fix the air conditioning system. So sometimes you don't really know that something wrong, but you can go back and check the data logger and see if there was a either maybe a gradual increase or sudden if the power goes out for any reason. Okay, and so you would have those probably in each of these rooms? Yes, yeah. so I have one in each room. I think I actually have one inside a cabinet in one of the rooms. And it's really inter interesting to see how having a little bit of buffer really protects from the humidity. So like the more um, boxes or cabinets you have things in, buried in, it, it moderates the temperature even more. Oh. So the data logger that's inside one of the cabinets in here has a more stable temperature relative humidity than the one out in the room because just that barrier of having a cabinet and a box helps, um, helps keep it a little more protected. So that's a great way for your own personal possessions if you want to keep them a little more protected, so you, like double box them. Oh, that's great. That's a great tip. <laughs> and, and one other thing just to keep in mind also is don't keep your personal family papers in your attic. We don't really have basements in Florida, but if you're, if you're up north, uh, try not to keep them in hot attics or hot um, or, or damp basements. So try to keep your personal family, you know, your, your great, great grandpa's discharge, you know, war discharge papers, your photos, try to keep them in a cool, dry um, environment and again keep it dark so they don't get faded or um, destroyed by the light. Well thank you so much Anne for showing me all of this um, this space and the collection and allowing us all to visit. All right. So thanks for I'm glad to be on your tour and I hope everyone has a great day and I've learned a lot during their during their tour of this curatorial storage building. Thanks again. Bye bye. Bye. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I had so much fun visiting Timucuan and seeing how this museum facility um, special collection is different from the public library and I hope you enjoyed it as well. If you need help getting a hold of a copy of the library book, please just ask anybody at the St. John's County Public Library System. They'd be happy to help you um, get a hold of a copy. And please be sure to check out the rest of our St. John's Reads programming that's happening online all throughout the month of January. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, comment on it, and share it. And I hope I see you at the library very soon. Have a great day, bye-bye.